On the 12th of March, 1938, the strangest invasion in history begins. German tanks roll across the border into Austria. They're welcomed by smiling civilians who greet the German Führer, Adolf Hitler, as a hero. This is the moment when the countdown to the Second World War begins. The decisions and actions Hitler takes over the next 18 months will drag the world to war. Without him, there would be no Second World War. No Holocaust, no senseless killing of millions of people. To understand how it happened, we need to understand him. In this series, we're telling the story of these 18 months, from the 12th of March, 1938, to the 3rd of September, 1939, through the eyes of Hitler himself, revealing how this bully, gambler, and arch manipulator brought the world to the edge of destruction. This time, We've reached the 19th of March, 1939. Hitler has invaded Czechoslovakia, a clear act of aggression. While at home, the Nazis have launched vicious attacks on Germany's Jews. The world has finally woken up to the Nazi threat. But Hitler is determined to go even further. War now seems closer than ever. Four days after successfully invading Czechoslovakia, Hitler's back in Berlin. The returning hero, he's greeted by an extravagant victory parade. Hitler is driven to the new Reich Chancellery down the Unter den Linden through a tunnel of light with searchlights beaming into the sky. There's a fireworks display. There are lots of crowds of people on the streets because it seems like the Fuhrer has done it again. He's taken the whole of Czech Republic without a shot being fired. Hitler appears on the balcony to rapturous cheers from the people. As usual, he gives the Hitler salute. He's well prepared for the task. He actually spends time every morning doing extender exercises to build up the muscles in his arm so he can do that. And it shows you the lengths to which he's prepared to go to give the right impression. But beyond these celebrations in Berlin, it's another story. Most German people aren't happy about the occupation of Czechoslovakia. What we've got now is a bit more of a fear about where this is going to lead. Was it really necessary? Hitler's actions and his risk-taking has made a world war more possible, and that is something not everyone is happy about. But any Germans who disagree with Hitler's actions are far too frightened to speak out. Since 1933, the Nazi regime has really been encroaching, impinging German people's lives in every way possible. Hitler has established the Hitler Youth and the League of German Girls, which were youth organisations which effectively indoctrinated children into the Nazi regime and promoted them as Germany's future. Adolf Hitler forces the German army to swear personal allegiance to himself. Adolf Hitler! He makes the judges swear allegiance to him. 
Hitler also creates two secret forces, the Gestapo, the secret police, and the SS, a special crack squad, who essentially police every aspect of life in Nazi Germany. He's also made Germany a very uncomfortable environment to live in for any groups of people he feels are anti the German regime, such as the Jewish population, homosexuals, gypsies, pretty much anybody he considers other. Essentially what it means is that all aspects of people's lives are under control. Today, as he stands on the balcony of the new Reich Chancellery, Hitler is undisputed leader of a one-party police state. A dictator who believes he should get whatever he wants, which makes him a danger to Germany and the world. Less than a week later, Hitler meets with his army chiefs at the new Reich Chancellery. He tells them that having taken Austria and Czechoslovakia, he's now got his eyes on his biggest prize yet. Hitler's initial aims, as far as Poland is concerned, are Danzig and the Polish Corridor. And the reason for that is that these are territories that Germany has been forced to give up at the end of the First World War. He not only wants back the city of Danzig and the Polish Corridor, but he wants Poland itself to also become another German satellite state. It's a large country which he considers fit for repopulating with Germans from this expanding population. It takes Germany to the frontiers of the Soviet Union, the ultimate destination for German settlers. Hitler decides to use the same strategy that worked so well when he invaded Austria and Czechoslovakia. Hitler says, right, I want this back. And he thinks that the same tactics, bullying, browbeating, all the rest of it is gonna work again. But the Polish government is wise to what Hitler wants to do, and they reject his advances. Worse still, they tell the British about what's going on. In London, the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain hears about Hitler's aggressive bullying of Poland. He's had enough, and this time he does something different. He very publicly stands up to him. Chamberlain says, right, that's it. We will guarantee Poland's sovereignty. If Germany invades Poland, goes into the Zanzig Corridor, we will go to war. And France says exactly the same thing. Back in Berlin, Hitler is outraged. He's so angry that he slams his hand down as hard as he can on a marble top table in the New Reich's Chancellery and utters the immortal phrase, I'll brew him a devil's potion. But he swiftly comes to believe that this is mere words on the part of Chamberlain and that the British can't seriously want to risk their entire empire for Poland. Hitler just doesn't believe what the British and French are telling him. He thinks he knows better. He's convinced that the Allies won't go to war to stop him taking Poland. And he's prepared to risk everything to see if he's right. It's the 3rd of April, and Hitler is on holiday. He's on board the maiden voyage of a cruise ship called the Robert Lai. The Robert Lai is part of Strength Through Joy, which is essentially the Nazi leisure organization. So they're responsible for cheap holidays for Germans, subsidized theater and cinema trips. And the point of this was to really indoctrinate the population, not just to infiltrate them during the day while they're doing their jobs, but actually to control their leisure time too. Hitler's enjoying a few days at sea, mingling with starstruck holidaymakers. 
But of course, Hitler's never really off duty. As the cruise sails on, he's busy plotting his next move. He gives orders for the military commanders to prepare for Case White, which is his name for the preparations for the attack on Poland. Hitler's determined to invade Poland, no matter who tries to stop him. But there's something Hitler needs to do first. The 20th of April is a big day for Germany. It's the Führer's 50th birthday. There was a big march past in Berlin, huge display of military might. He stands there kind of clenched jawed, this new Caesar. Some of the foreign diplomats there thought that these same tanks had gone round six or seven times to try and give the impression they had more tanks than they really had. If they hold a parade like this because he's 50 years old, can you imagine what they'll do when he's 100? Hitler's using his birthday celebrations to demonstrate Germany's military power to the world. It's a lot of saber rattling. And for most people in Europe who can remember the First World War all too clearly, this is really an escalation. This is really intimidating. This is very, very disturbing indeed to witness. The birthday celebrations continue because he's given a number of really quite significant birthday presents that include letters from one of his great heroes, Frederick the Great. And the model of the Victory Arch, which is the demonstration of the new Berlin the new Germany that will rise from the ashes. Hitler's determined his 50th year is going to be a memorable one. A week later, Hitler's at the Kroll Opera House in Berlin, giving a speech to the German parliament. He steps up the aggression. He makes two big war-thumping announcements. First, that the non-aggression treaty with Poland is null and void. The other thing he does is to tear up the Anglo-German naval agreement, which until now has stopped an arms race between the two nations. The significance of this is showing that he is absolutely going to force Poland down, if necessary, by force of arms, but also that he is not scared of confronting the British. So far, Hitler has acted cautiously in public. He's been careful not to provoke Britain and France. But now, he's becoming impatient. And that's to do with something personal. For years, he's believed that he doesn't have long to live. Hitler's fear of dying young began when he was just 18 years old. Hitler's mother, Clara, becomes ill with breast cancer in 1907, and Hitler returns from Vienna to nurse her, and he shows great compassion towards her. She has an operation, and she seems to be recovering, and then it gets worse again. And at that time, Hitler is nursing her pretty much every day. He's completely devoted to his mother. It could well be said that Clara Hitler is the only person that Adolf Hitler ever truly loved. Clara finally succumbs to her illness, aged just 47. Adolf is inconsolable. But his mother's death causes him more than just heartbreak it buries itself deep inside him. This played into Hitler's psyche somehow, and he sort of went forward in life with this idea that he too perhaps would die young. It makes a hypochondriac of himself. He worries at every small health complaint. He has small stomach cramps. He gets very tensed and stressed and nervous about his own health. Hitler's fear of dying young will drive him on to achieve his goals as quickly as possible.
Two weeks after his birthday celebrations, Hitler heads to the Berghof, his picturesque retreat in Berchtesgaden, in the Bavarian mountains, to mull over his next move. He's calculating, he's trying to work out. It's, it's such a momentous decision to go into Poland. The stakes have never been higher. And has he got his ducks in a row? Is he making the right decision? What happens if Britain and France do declare war? Are they strong enough to take them on? And I think he just feels that at the Berghof, that is the place where he can think the clearest. But to onlookers, it seems as though Hitler is on holiday, far from the beating heart of government. He spends more time with the Berghof than he does in Berlin. This is very unusual. This is like the British Prime Minister, you know, living in the, in the Lake District. Hitler's weighing up a momentous political decision, but he's joined not by his cabinet ministers, but by his long-term partner, Eva Braun. Eva Braun is this naive, innocent figure. She's young, blonde, Aryan-looking, beautiful. She's a photographer's assistant, which is how Hitler first comes into contact with her. Hitler's relationship with Eva Braun is very curious. They don't seem to have a lot in common. She's not interested in politics. She's not a member of the Nazi party. She's interested more in gymnastics and photography. She's interested in films and those kinds of things. Despite their lengthy relationship, Eva Brown always travels separately, stays in different hotels, and is kept away from official functions. Hitler is careful to keep their relationship secret from the German people. You know, he wants this idea that he is wedded to the German people, which is why he doesn't have children, which is why he's never married. This is his job. This is his parenting. He is the father of Nazi Germany. Two days after his arrival at the Berghof, Hitler's joined by a group of loyal friends who all support him without question. You're beginning to see kind of distortion of reality as far as Hitler's concerned because he's just surrounding himself with yes men. And it's becoming difficult for anyone to actually talk to him, much less to criticize his plans. He gets up late, he's quite erratic. He's very much internalized within himself, comparing himself to great leaders like Napoleon and Bismarck. Clearly, he's turning into an absolute megalomaniac. He doesn't want to be deviating from his destiny, from providence. Intent on fulfilling that destiny, Hitler is carefully plotting how to pull off his Polish invasion. Hitler is aware that he does need allies. He's increasingly and repeatedly railed against Britain and France and even the US. So it's important that he also has allies, at least within Europe. So Hitler now turns to the one European country that's always stood by him, Italy and its leader Mussolini. Two weeks later, Hitler's in the grand reception hall of the new Reich Chancellery. He's here for the signing of a military alliance between Germany and Italy. With typical understatement, it's known as the Pact of Steel. The Pact of Steel now is a moment where they agree to fight side by side in the event of war. This is a great piece of diplomacy on Hitler's part. He secured a key military alliance in Europe. Now, he can step up his planning for war. Early the following morning, Hitler calls his military leaders to his office in the new Reich Chancellery for a secret meeting. 
He's got important news for them. Hitler's putting his cards on the table and he tells them pretty bluntly that there's going to be a war in the East. That he will attack Poland at the most favorable opportunity, that this will start a war, and it may be a war that could last for a long time. It could last, he says, up to 10 years. Hitler also tells his generals that war with Britain and France is inevitable at some point, but that he wants to avoid a war with the West until German rearmament is complete, a process that he sees as finishing in 1943. Hitler's briefing that day signals a major escalation. It's clear his plans for war are expanding well beyond Poland's borders. I think you can see from this point onwards that Hitler believes a world war is inevitable. Hitler's lit the blue touch paper, and it's unclear whether anyone can put it out. As his preparations for war continue behind closed doors, Hitler pretends to the watching world that nothing out of the ordinary is going on. On the 7th of June, he embarks on a series of very public travels around Germany. Hitler visits the Volkswagen plant at Fallersleben. He loves cars and he's been involved in the design of the Volkswagen Beetle. From here, Hitler goes to Vienna, where he watches Richard Strauss's opera, A Day of Peace, which is quite ironic given the current situation. And he goes back to his hometown and visits his father's home and his old school. Then Hitler travels to Munich, where he looks at an exhibition of German art, which he celebrates as being pure and also in keeping with Nazi ideology. It's Adolf Hitler, the domestic leader of the Third Reich, that's very much on show here, not Adolf Hitler, the warmonger, who's about to plunge the world into the second global conflict that century. To the public, it's business as usual. But in private, Hitler's preparations for war are accelerating. Hitler returns to the Berghof and announces to his generals that the invasion of Poland will begin on the 26th of August, which is just a fortnight's time. Hitler's in a confident mood, and that's because of something quite unexpected. Throughout the summer, his ministers have been secretly negotiating a deal with the unlikeliest of allies. Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union. This is a particularly surprising development given how large the Soviet Union looms as an enemy in the Nazi worldview. Hitler's primary ideological enemy throughout his life has been Bolshevism. They are, as far as he is concerned, the Antichrist. He believes the Marxists, the communists, uh, are the great enemy. He's conflated them with the Jews. And really, there is going to be a reckoning in his mind between the USSR and Germany at some stage. So why would he do a deal with them at this stage? In fact, it had been Stalin who'd reached out first. Stalin? He is naturally paranoid, and his paranoia at this time has convinced him that the British and the French are really trying to manufacture a war between Germany and the Soviet Union. Stalin's terribly worried that the Soviet Union is simply not ready to face an onslaught from the Nazis. So he's very keen to have a deal with Hitler which buys him time. But Hitler can see how an alliance with Russia could oil the wheels of his Polish invasion. He's either got to invade Poland and risk that Britain and France will come in a war against him, or he can isolate Poland. And perhaps the best way of isolating Poland will be to have some kind of agreement with the Soviet Union. Hitler thinks that with the might of Russia on Germany's side, Britain and France wouldn't dare to intervene, leaving Poland 
unprotected. A week later, and Hitler's planned invasion of Poland is just six days away. But he still doesn't have a deal with Stalin. A deal which he believes will stop the British and French from coming to Poland's aid. So he makes an unusual move. Hitler sends him a personal telegram, and in that personal telegram, he outlines all the reasons why this deal is going to be good not only for Germany, but also for the USSR. The question is, what's going to happen next? Hitler waits, but minutes turn into hours, and there's no reply. Tensions are running very high at the Berghof. 28 hours go by and still no news. At dinner, Hitler's more agitated than usual. Then, finally, a servant brings a note. Word reaches him that Stalin is willing to sign a pact. And at that moment, he bangs the table with his fist and says, we have got them. It is a moment of absolute euphoria for Hitler. Hitler's triumphant. He thinks his deal with Stalin will neutralize the British and the French, leaving him free to invade Poland unopposed. But he's about to be disappointed. News of Hitler's pact with Stalin quickly spreads. Well, the rest of the world is absolutely horrified by this. And of course, what it does is it ratchets up the tensions and makes everyone realize that war is probably no longer going to be avoidable. But Hitler seriously misjudged things. Despite his deal with Russia, the British are still determined to stop him. And on the 23rd of August, the British ambassador to Germany, Neville Henderson, travels to the Berghof to talk to Hitler. Neville Henderson is very much the classic British diplomat of the time, the stereotypical English gentleman, typical of his class and his generation. Neville Henderson delivers this message from Chamberlain, which is that if you go into Poland, we will honor our obligations to Poland. There'll be no Czechoslovakia this time around, chum. It will mean war. Hitler is not expecting this. He believes that Britain is going to continue with its policy of appeasement. Hitler is absolutely furious. He turns on his temper and explodes, claiming that it is Britain that is trying to annihilate Germany, a completely preposterous claim. He says that he is prepared, if necessary, for war, that he would prefer war now than in five or 10 years' time. Hitler is so angry that Henderson can't reason with him, and he walks out. But once Henderson's left, Hitler's mood immediately changes. Hitler slaps his thigh and says, I've done it. He believes that the British cabinet will fall the next day, that Chamberlain, confronted with his determination to press on with Poland, will cause the British to back down. He's completely wrong. Chamberlain doesn't back down and, in fact, reiterates that Britain is going to defend Poland. And so Hitler starts to question his belief that Britain would never intervene in this conflict. Maybe, just maybe, he's wrong. With just two days to go before his planned invasion, Hitler returns to Berlin. But his arrival goes uncelebrated. Hitler notices that the cheering crowds are nowhere to be seen. It's quite clear to Hitler that the German people don't want another war. Even more doubts whirl through Hitler's mind.
It's Friday, the 25th of August. Hitler still plans to invade Poland at dawn the next day. But in a last ditch attempt to get the British on side, he invites Neville Henderson to the new Reich Chancellery. He's in a very different mood to their last meeting. Hitler's realized maybe he did overstep the mark at the Berghof. And he tries to really put his cards on the table. Look, here is how we can solve this. He tells Henderson that he has no quarrel with Britain or the British Empire. In fact, he would like to guarantee the British Empire that if it was ever in trouble, German troops would fight alongside British troops, maintaining India for Britain. But all of this, of course, is predicated on the fact that they will solve the Polish question to Hitler's satisfaction. This is a fairly crude attempt to separate the British not only from the Poles, but also from the French. Hitler sends Henderson back to London, he even puts a plane at his disposal to make sure that he gets back to London as quickly as possible. But Hitler's offer isn't worth the paper it's written on. As soon as Henderson leaves the Chancery, Hitler signs the order declaring that the attack against Poland is to begin at dawn the following morning. Despite his assurances to Henderson, Hitler's set on war. But then, his plans start to unravel. At 5.30 p.m., the French ambassador arrives and tells Hitler that the French will definitely fight if Poland is attacked. Then news arrives from Britain. The British have signed a formal military alliance with Poland. Hitler's absolutely staggered. He'd been convinced that the British had been bluffing. Then news comes from Mussolini, who Hitler had expected would back him in any military conflict. Mussolini? has decided that he doesn't have the resources to go to war and that if there's a war growing out of the dispute with Poland, that Italy will remain neutral. Hitler's stunned. In one hour, he has lost one ally on whom he was relying and gained the two adversaries who he had been convinced and importantly told everyone else would stand aside. Hitler's invasion of Poland now looks riskier than ever. Is he willing to gamble everything and take that risk? When Hitler learns that Britain and France have done an alliance with the Poles and that Mussolini will not be coming in on the war on his side, he calls a halt to the invasion of Poland, which is at that moment only nine hours away. The atmosphere in the Reich Chancellery is febrile. Everything has been thrown into chaos by Hitler's decision. Hermann Göring asks Hitler, is that the case? Has it been cancelled? And Hitler goes, no, 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 no. We're still going into Poland. This is just a stopgap to see if we can forestall the British. Earlier in the day, Hitler had offered to support the British Empire so long as they allow him to invade Poland. He's still convinced they'll agree. Now, he has to wait for their response. While he waits, Hitler puts Germany on war footing. The Nazi government announced to the people that war is imminent and to prepare for war. So anti-aircraft guns are installed onto rooftops, transport is limited, and Germany begins rationing. The mood of the German people at this point is rather resigned to war, but there's certainly very little enthusiasm. Indeed, many of them are miserable at the prospect of a new war. On the streets of London, the British people are just as resigned. But there's one difference. They're seeing that Hitler has to be stopped, so whilst they don't like the idea of going to war either, they understand that it's necessary. This is a war that neither the British 
nor the Germans relish in the slightest. Two days later, and there's still no word from Britain. The tension is getting to Hitler. He looks exhausted and at times appears to be cracking up. He starts ranting about how if the British do stand by Poland, he will destroy them. He says, if the British intervene, I will build U-boats, U-boats, U-boats. I will build aircraft, 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 everything in short, staccato sentences. If they deny us butter, I will be the first to stop eating butter, butter, butter. It seems that he's completely lost the plot. But he recovers it. He issues orders that the invasion will begin on the 1st of September, and he is not in the habit of changing his mind twice. Then, at 5 p.m. that day, Neville Henderson finally returns to Berlin with news from London. Hitler receives him at the Chancellery at 10.30 p.m. Henderson returns to Berlin and finds Hitler again in a polite and affable mood. Henderson says to him, we've been talking to the Poles and the Poles have actually agreed to negotiate directly with you, but you are gonna need to do those negotiations. Really, Britain is kind of like pushing Hitler into a corner now. You know, how is he gonna get out of this? And Hitler immediately sees this as a trap because he realizes if he doesn't at least attempt to begin these negotiations, he's going to be seen as a warmonger, not only by the Allies, but also by his own people. So Hitler plays for time. He says he'll think about Britain's offer and respond the next day. Then, later that night, Hitler confers with his closest advisers. It's interesting that not all of Hitler's entourage are great warmongers at this point. And it's Hermann Göring who actually says to Hitler, you know, maybe we don't need to push this. Maybe we don't need to invade. Maybe we don't need to go for broke. But Hitler replies, I have gone for broke all my life. This has been his greatest strength. He has been a gambler who has gambled again and again and again, and he has won and he has won and he has won. And he cannot conceive that his luck will run out, and he cannot conceive of a different way of operating. The next evening, Henderson returns again to the Chancellery. This time, Hitler's in a very different mood. Hitler has once again swung back into his most aggressive mood. He says that the Polish question has to be solved immediately. He will submit to these provocations no longer. He is prepared to enter into negotiations, he tells Henderson, but only if they send a Polish negotiator within 24 hours, and he knows perfectly well this isn't possible, and so does Henderson. Henderson says to Hitler, this sounds like an ultimatum, but Hitler demands that Henderson relay this information back to the British government. This is all part of Hitler's grand plan. He's deliberately acted as though he's willing to enter negotiations with Poland. But at the same time, he's ensured that they'll never happen, allowing him to claim that the Poles have rejected his offer of a peaceful settlement. The very next day, the British decline Hitler's suggestion of a Polish negotiator arriving within 24 hours. Hitler meets his generals and tells them that the invasion will definitely begin on the 1st of September. With less than a day before invasion, there seems to be no going back for Hitler. He's going to go into Poland. He's going to take back the Danzig Corridor. He's going to wipe Poland from the face of the earth. Nothing is going to stop him. He's going to roll the dice because this is his destiny. This is Germany's destiny, and he's the leader of the German people. At 
4.45 a.m. on the 1st of September 1939, Hitler finally launches his invasion of Poland. In the early hours of the 1st of September, the battleship to Schleswig-Holstein opens fire on Danzig. And not long after that, the invasion proper begins when one and a half million German soldiers, tanks, and planes pour across the border in what they hope is going to be a lightning war that will defeat the Poles very quickly. Even as his troops mow down Polish soldiers, Hitler still believes that the British and French won't intervene. But behind closed doors, they're feverishly deciding what to do next. Two days after Germany invades Poland, Neville Henderson makes one last fateful visit to the new Reich Chancellery. He presents Hitler with a British ultimatum. It says that if Germany does not withdraw her troops from Poland within hours, then Britain will honor her obligations towards Poland and declare war on Germany. When Hitler finally realized his calculation that the British ultimately won't go to war against him is proven to be false, he's utterly shocked. He sits there almost in stunned silence and then turns to the rest of his advisors with a furious look on his face and says, what now? Two hours after Henderson's delivery of the British ultimatum, at 11 a.m. on the 3rd of September, 1939, Britain declares war on Germany. France follows soon after. This is the war that Hitler has craved for years. The inevitable consequence of his desire for a greater German Reich. But it's a war he's starting on the back foot. He's allied with his ideological main enemy, the Soviet Union. And he's at war with the Western powers who he always thought would never go to war with him. He's also quite concerned about the capacity of Germany's own military to meet the challenges he's set for them. So for an awful lot of people in Germany, and including generals and senior military commanders, this is the road to Armageddon, not the thousand year Reich. Unwilling and unable to stop himself, Hitler has thrown the dice once more. His actions over the last 18 months, from the moment he invaded Austria, his lying, his bullying, his aggression, have all led to this moment. Adolf Hitler has plunged the world into war. Six, 